So, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's a late afternoon already and uh, you are pretty tired, I figure. So uh, I will try to be brief and also try to catch up a bit on the time we have lost uh, earlier today. Uh, what I want to do is to take you on a field trip to around Sweden a bit to visit some of our patients that we have had an opportunity to visit in their homes. Um, and interesting enough, I don't know how it is in, in your home countries, but uh, in many countries now there is an openness to actually doing research in the area of ME and also long COVID. Suddenly the politicians, uh, the critical colleagues and uh, the skepticists out there uh, have uh, been become a bit milder at least. So for instance, we can sit on primetime Swedish television talking about post-infectious consequences for neurodegeneration and neurocognitive uh, disturbances. And I think that is a, a good opportunity and also a good sign of that we have finally reached some sort of uh, understanding and also scientific base to stand on when it comes to explaining some of these uh, issues that we are dealing with. So, as you know, there is a lot of patients out there uh, that are suffering from the disease, ME, but now when we see long COVID uh, coming along, uh, Vicky presented uh, numbers from the United States and on a global level, we have maybe about 700 million people have had COVID. And if this, the percentage that Vicky said, 10% of those will have long-term consequences. That's an enormous amount of patients. Uh, let's say it's only 1% still, there is a lot of patients coming. And we can see that now in Sweden, in Scandinavia and around the world. So how will we deal with this? We, we cannot probably have specialist clinics everywhere in each small village. In Sweden, we have had a discussion recently with the politicians that we will create a specialist competence center on a national level, probably in, in Stockholm or in the surroundings. And then hopefully they will also support specialist competence centers uh, locally or regionally, in, at least in some different parts in Sweden. And that will also benefit our ME patients. I think that is going to be a, an opportunity to actually get closer to the patients and not have them traveling across the country or uh, in worst case, not being able to meet any of the specialists. So you all know this, but I just want to point out that uh, a patient can be in many different phases uh, of, of her and his disease. So, this, for instance, uh, patient Andrea, typical case, was infected at the year, uh, age of 22 and uh, most likely an Epstein-Barr virus uh, mononucleosis infection. After a few months uh, of not recovering, the progression continued in, in her situation and jumping a bit uh, has all the clean classical uh, ME symptoms that we find in, in most of our patients. At today, fully bedbound at home and uh, nursed by her family. And you all know about this situation, unfortunately. So when it comes to patients that are uh, having a disease for a long time, of course, there comes in acute phase, a chronic phase, and also variability over, uh, over the years and over the weeks and months. And we did a study uh, actually on an initiative of a patient and her mother to record uh, a situation for a 17-year-old girl in Sweden. And I won't go into any details here, but you can find this online and, and read a bit about it. It's a very nice, very personalized story from a parent and also from the patient. And we have been uh, able to follow her with, for a long time now, which is nice. And this girl, she made a fantastic contribution. She wrote, uh, had a diary she collected every day in the morning. She stated her uh, situation, how severe her symptoms were. And as you can see, the fluctuations over the weeks and months and years is uh, quite obvious. And of course, this is a pattern we would like to follow more in detail and actually be able to understand what is going on. Uh, what is causing these up and downs as, uh, as we know our patients have. So 
temporary soil sampling uh, is something that we have been struggling with. We, we really would like to get more detailed information from all our patients, not only at the time point when we see them at the clinic, but also uh, over time, uh, maybe during a whole day or over several weeks or every month or so. And of course that has some restrictions. It's not so, so easy to get that kind of sampling uh, unless we can do something in their homes. So during the pandemic, we initiated an um, experiment where we, were, we set off to actually go visit patients in their homes instead of trying to transport them to the research facility. And this is actually an uh, international collaboration, we could say, uh, in Sweden with my uh, people and in Australia with Chris Armstrong's uh, group. And we have set up similar uh, profile or similar uh, procedures. So we do draw blood samples very frequent over a day. We have different tasks. And in Uppsala, we have focused on a mental uh, evaluation, a social activity, and a, a very mild physical activity, as I will show you. In uh, Australia, Chris has focused on uh, controlled standardized meals and looks what happens after a meal and looking into the metabolic uh, disturb uh, or the changes that happens during food intake. And the evaluation is done uh, with the collected materials, it's ongoing, it's going to be uh, full metabolo metabolomic uh, screening and analysis both with liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry and with NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, together with surveys and clinical information, etc. And all, all overall, it's about 3,000 samples that's been collected uh, and it's going to be analyzed. So the hypothesis that we started with in Uppsala, and of course this is something that is very general and you have heard so much about mitochondrial activity and disturbances and ATP, uh, lack of ATP production and so on. Um, so I won't go into any details here. Uh, but lactate is, as you understood from my colleagues earlier today, very, a very important marker. If we see increased levels of lactate, uh, that also points us in the direction of a uh, dysfunctional mitochondrial activity. Uh, another target that we have specifically, and that is thanks to the collaboration with uh, Ola Sig uh, Saugstad, uh, is to look for hypoxanthin, and uh, that's a good marker for uh, hypoxia. And in this little pathway, a bit simpler than the mitochondrial one, you see that when we produce ATP and consume ATP uh, in the presence of normal oxygen levels, that works fine, but if we have a hypoxic situation, uh, we, we actually increase, uh, or yeah, we decrease the enzymes, as you see here, enzyme activity here, here, and here, and that results in uh, increased level of hypoxanthin. And we set sail, uh, we packed our laboratory, uh, collection devices, uh, an ergometer uh, bike into a car and started driving. And we drove from Uppsala to the west coast of Sweden. So we were focusing on this region here and there were different reasons for that. We had some practical uh, possibilities to stay over at relatives' houses and uh, yeah, find places to stay and find colleagues to use and so on. But also there was a lack of uh, specialists in that region uh, to see patients. And the initiative came uh, from us in Uppsala together with a medical student, Hanna Gustafsson, who has made a fantastic contribution to this work. So we see Hanna here in, yeah, I can't point so, in one of the patients' kitchens where we have started building the laboratory when we reached their house. And another colleague, Anders Pagesson, has also helped out uh, at some places. When we got close to his house, we could both stay over very nicely, got good food, and also had him help us with the collection and so on. So quite an interesting expedition around uh, Sweden, the west coast of Sweden specifically. So what we did when we came to the patients after unloading this car full with stuff, uh, we set a first test, and the test is a cognitive exertion test. And we asked the patient to read one page, A4 page, um, of text. And the text were actually selected 
a part of Ola Saugstads book about oxygen. It's a rather complicated uh, text, but it's a very fascinating story. And also as a contribution to Ola, we thought that was a fun, <laughs> fun thing to do. Uh, and after the patient had read the text, we, they knew they were going to get a, a question. So we asked them a control question just to see how they did. We matched the time it took for them to read the text, and we also checked if they could answer the question. The question is not trivial. Uh, most of our healthy controls uh, managed to f remember what the answer was. But many of our patients did not. And some of the patients really struggled with reading. We had some break and the rest for the patient in between. Then we had test number two. It was a sort of a social exertion, 15 minutes of conversation. We had actually one problem that patients, they were so happy to see us. So they could not stop conversating with us. <laughs> so we had a bit of trouble to get them to baseline actually before. So we really had to tell them not to talk too much. Rest, rest, rest. So we got a baseline. Then we had a 50 minutes uh, conversation uh, and uh, we had a standardized nutrition intake, a Swedish choklad bowl, <laughs> Swedish chocolate bowl, very, very dense in energy, I have to say, uh, but also gluten-free, vegan, perfect, everything, and rather tasty. But have you had like 50 of them? You are so tired of <laughs> choklad bowl. Because the idea was that we would, in the social exertion, also eat with them and drink a coffee, so as we do, fika, as we say in Swedish. Okay, after that, rest. And then finally, a low intensity physical exertion. And I stress the low uh, intensity here. It's five minutes on an er ergometer at 25 watts. That's the lowest you can ever get a bike uh, going on, on uh, these standardized ergometers. Uh, and it's not a patient laying, <laughs> laying here. <laughs> it's, it is Hanna actually who, who is fixing something under the bike. It looks, <laughs> so the patients did actually, those of, uh, we had to select uh, patients who were not able to sit up. Of course, we could not do this part of the experiment. But those that managed to sit on the bike uh, with support, they, they managed well actually. Uh, so the sampling were blood sample drawn and we put a venous catheter in that baseline. Uh, we took sample, we did test one, we continued to follow with the venous sampling every five, ten, 15 and 30 minutes after the exertion and then we had rest period between. And then came test two and then came test three. Uh, Traveling around with the ambulatory laboratory is not easy, I can say. We had some uh, incidences with the car and we had, uh, and it was also partly winter time. So Sweden can be quite uh, snowy and slippery, as you know. But everything went well. Uh, <clears throat> in the end of the day, we had a lot of things carrying out and into the car and uh, uh, it looked rather messy, partly, but uh, everybody who we came home to, they were so happy and let their home up. And uh, even if they were living in a flat, uh, four stairs up, we managed to carry the 77 kilo bike up there without an elevator. Uh, blood drones were made, and uh, as I said, we had fantastic help of, here's for instance, Hanna's uh, aunt, who, seemed, who happened to be a nurse. So so we could get her to help us partly working on. There was also a lot of poor food intake for us as researchers. We had to stop and eat uh, often mid middle of the night at some uh, fast food chain. I was so tired of not only choklad bowl, but also hamburgers. So I haven't eaten any anyone since then, I think. So just briefly, the characteristics of the patients and uh, the match controls, uh, nothing strange here actually. Um, we, did f we did follow them on activity and we did that not in a very ordin uh, ordered way. We, we just asked them to check their mobile phones and we can definitely see a significant uh, drop in uh, activity as we were expected. But uh, those that were poorest, they didn't have a mobile phone or don't carry it with them, so as you know. So this is not, it, it's even bigger differences I would say. Uh, 
at the place in their homes, we also had possibility to do direct DNA detection of glucose and lactate. So we man monitored glucose lactate during the whole day, basically, in the patients and collected all that data. Um, and we also did the preparation of the samples. We uh, used a centrifuge, portable centrifuge, that I had to rebuild myself because we couldn't get, get the company to fix it for us. I was upset and then I just took it into the tool shop and drilled it. <laughs> it works, actually, so it, it's not too bad. Uh, we prepared cells and uh, plasma and then had the portable freezer so we could uh, freeze everything and then put it in, in the car and transport it to our... Uh, facility for deep freezing and so on. We collected uh, medical history, physical, physiological tests. Uh, oi, am I doing anything? Yeah, we are back. Um, and uh, different questionnaires, of course, uh, pre and post examination. So quality of life, uh, SF36, BANS, the post PEM scale, etc. And just some brief uh, to show, show how dramatic changes you actually can see already at very low uh, levels of exertion. As you saw, uh, Carl presented very nicely the data from uh, uh, Katarina Lien, uh, where you had two days of uh, exertion on, on a bike. Here we do five minutes on the lowest uh, effort, and we still see a significant difference in our patients uh, compared with our controls. And if we break that data up, it's in actually quite interesting to see that there are typically two uh, different populations in the patient group. And uh, one is almost like the controls, and the second group is more this profile. So extensive, long-term, uh, higher level of, of lactate in, in their blood. So uh, what we are doing right now is uh, th trying to squeeze through all these 3,000 samples, uh, doing full screening metabolomics, and you've heard so much about metabolomics already, so I won't dwell too much on that. But uh, of course, metabolome is very interesting because it can also reveal things that we, we don't know exactly that we should target, as you heard earlier today. Uh, and it's also something that activates and, and deactivates very quickly. So uh, DNA doesn't change so fast. Uh, proteins takes, if you need a new protein synthesized, takes about four hours. Metabolome changes within microseconds. So for doing a temporary resolved sampling like we did now, uh, the metabolome is very interesting to do a uh, full analysis of. And the analytical coverage that we have in our method is sort of targeting most of the mechanisms that has been discussed earlier here at the meeting. Uh, we target approximately 800 different molecules uh, with absolute quantitation, so which also is nice because we always can refer back to any other study where you have nanogram per ml concentration levels. And for the future also, we will always be able to tell that this molecule had that concentration in, in these samples. It's not a ratio or, uh, or something else. So just showing some preliminary data, uh, that Sandy, my PhD student, uh, sent us. And uh, I want to point out that what we find actually, which is very interesting, phenylalanine is increased and in, significantly increased in the patient. And hypoxanthin actually is significantly increased in the patients already at the base level. So this story is going to be continued. Uh, I hope we will manage to get all the analysis done soon. So I can, uh, we can put all this together. It's an enormous uh, workload to put the, all the data together also, but we are uh, <laughs> relying on our friends in Harvard who will help us with the bioinformatics part also, Wensong and Peng Li. And uh, unfortunately, my train is very small. Uh, you saw the train in the beginning. This train is actually my great-grandfather's uncle who ran this train between Kosta and Lessebo. It's in Småland, a region in Sweden. Uh, it was a very slow train, apparently. They always said that uh, uh, the passengers could jump off the train and, and pick uh, two liters of blueberries on the way to, and then catch up on the train. So it was small and not very fast. 
in the family, we also have a family crest, uh, as you see here. And uh, our family motto, apparently, I don't know who picked that one. It says, uh, mödan min glädje. That means trouble is my delight. Uh, very uh, odd motto to catch, I think. But anyway. However, we are hopeful for uh, that we will be able to contribute and help patients for the future. And uh, as uh, Simon mentioned, horses is a big deal. Which I, when I don't rad, run trains, I, uh, I try to stay on a horse. Uh, and we do that uh, as much as we can. So I just want to thank all the patients and the controls that has contributed to this uh, experiment. A fantastic opportunity to work so close with all you patients. Uh, a big thanks to Open Medicine Foundation, who has been supportive and continues to support our research, and Linda Tannenbaum specifically, uh, the Swedish Patient Organization, uh, UK of course, Invest in ME and ME Research UK, Solve ME and anonymous and non-anonymous uh, donors, the family Kampra, that's the founder of IKEA, so think about that next time you go and buy a shelf bookshelf billy that they actually support ME some way, and the patient-led research uh, fund for long COVID. And I thank you for your interest. He's trying to say, is there a question? <laughs> <laughs> ah, is there a question? Yes, there is. This is on behalf of my son, he wants to know why reading a book hurts his legs. And I wondered if you found that in your research. Why reading a book hurt his legs? Yes. Hmm. That's a bit, uh, yeah, the <laughs> is it a very heavy book? No. 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 <laughs> he mostly no. reads on his phone because yeah. the bigger the page, the more energy it takes and that impacts on him. Mm -hmm. But he just, every time that he has to really concentrate on something, especially if it's educational, mm. that hurts his legs. And he's just saying, can you please ask him? Yeah, I, I, I'm not a bit able to answer that one, I think. But I mean, I think concentration may be the key. That uh, when you have a book, textbook, you have, uh, I mean, a fixed four font and so on. You cannot enlarge, you cannot uh, add lightning and so on. When, when you see a screen, it's maybe somewhat easier to read from, maybe, poten potentially. But otherwise, I don't have a clue, unfortunately. Uh, Christian may have the answer. Christian. Just oh no, comment quickly to, to say that. that was a very interesting uh, question because we've got two children with ME. Our son's very severe at the moment. Our daughter was severe but has improved significantly. And recently I wrote something for Wayne, which is the Welsh Association for ME-CFS. And I asked uh, my family, my children, for some descriptions, their own words, of their symptoms. It's, it's a ticket about post-exertional age, actually. And one of the things my daughter said was, uh, she's had a lot of trouble with reading. At, th at one point, she couldn't read at all. Mm -hmm. um, she couldn't focus, couldn't look straight ahead or something. Um, she developed dyslexic difficulties. And she said, um, the thing is that when I, when I read, try to read, I get pains in my legs. Mm -hmm. And she said, that's crazy. Why would that cause pains in my legs? Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to hear that. So Christian, Christian might have an idea. I don't yeah. know. Can I ask Christian? Yeah. It's very interesting. I'm a new pediatrician, and I see children, young persons who have ME. I see them early on in the course because in the course of the disease, because they have compulsory school, of course. So this symptom is very known in my pediatric population that pains in their legs, it's a subgroup, it's not that many, but it's, they say immediately when they cross their barrier, that's one of the symptoms that really increase and it's there. So it's mm. no. Mm. Yeah. But would it, dif would it differ from reading from a text or paper book to, to a screen, do you think? Oh, when they read from a screen, they always take small breaks. Mm. Uh, and it's yeah. a little bit different when they read the books. I think that would be my suggestion. Mm. 
uh, but it's generally just increased activity, Absolutely. whether it's lactate or whatever. Yeah, I mean, the pain in the legs could definitely be a, res a result of lactate, yes. That could be, but, uh, because that's what you feel. Okay, so I think we should move on to the next talk. Thank you very much, Jonas. Thank you.